Hello everybody, this is Manu S and welcome to another Eternal Contender series. Um, I chose to put the deck in Contenders despite me thinking that it's one of the best decks right now, possibly even the best despite uh, some consistency issues, because it's not widely adopted, you don't really see it much, and I figured it makes more sense to put the decks into top decks that are widely played, widely proven, and doing well widely rather than um, decks that I am more aware of than a majority and that might be better than some of the top decks or even in some cases all of them I guess um, but are not represented as a like majority deck. Um, all right so um, I want to talk to you about Aurelian Relics that uh, I have been working on for uh, a while and that Moosh um, piloted to a pretty good result at the uh, Ranked Masters Challenge and people have been asking for it so we'll dive right into it. Before we do so, hit the subscribe button, turn on the notification icon and please consider whitelisting eternaltitans.com and YouTube on your ad block to help support the content. And now on to the deck tech. All right, let's take a bit of a step back. I want to um, dive a bit in the history of this, into the history of this deck. Some people uh, might know the deck from Batteries, who has uh, had his own version, and I adopted some elements from his version uh, after having built my own, which was fairly different from uh, where he was at the time and started at. But I, uh, the two things, namely, that I adopted from him basically were the Pitfall Traps, which I initially didn't play and felt like they are too low impact and not really worth it in my initial build. And I was definitely pretty wrong about that. Pitfall Trap does a lot of good things for the deck aside from being cheap. And the other thing is the like Haunting Scream style. Um, no seed, no sigil, or rather by now still some sigils, but no seed um, power base, which I initially also had different. And he, uh, over while, moved to uh, a bit closer towards uh, what I had. For example, I had Teacher from the start. He uh, later started trying Teacher and stuff like that. He also didn't have display and came around on those later. We didn't directly work on the deck together, but uh, I streamed it a couple times and talked about it and he watched the stream and we talked about it on stream and stuff like that. So there was definitely some exchange of ideas and influence there, but um, we started on the deck kind of independent of each other. I just basically, I don't even know where I got the idea from. I kind of um, heard that there was uh, some builds of like a, Auralian colored red, uh, like colored red cage based relic deck with like Bizarre Stampede, and that was probably mainly due to uh, batteries championing it at the time. But it was just kind of like this thing that was around. I was like, hey, that sounds like a cool concept. I immediately had like a rough idea and direction in my mind what I wanted to try and that's where I started from basically and I was much heavier focused on like units and the relic synergy units basically and moved back and forth between them. Um, so yeah, now let's dive into the deck. Um, especially now with the new card Cryptic Master and uh, stuff like that, the deck moved even further towards being kind of like a aggressive uh, good stuff deck kind of similar to scream in a way even though operating fairly different but they both are kind of like playing three faction high quality cards under costed overstated threats very efficient support cards and just kind of um, being proactive and aggressive but also having a backup plan of kind of grinding or having a lot of reach like scream um, so that's an important part to understand and yeah, let's talk about the units. First, we have Lucky Prospector. This card is amazing. And uh, one of the things that I got immediately excited about, because I was excited about Prospector basically since he came out. But back then, I only managed to make it make a like kind of wonky uh, Explorer Sentinel aggressive deck sort of work uh, with a card that was as far as I gotten. And since then, we got a lot more tools. So the card's pretty great now, like a one cost 3-3 three, three endurance by turn 2 basically is amazing. Like, sure, sometimes you'll attack for 1 on turn 2 and then play your Crypt Master and then it's a 3-3, three, three, but even then, like, the amount of damage your 1-drop puts out and the offense-defense it plays is just amazing. Um, next we have the mentioned Crypt Master. Basically, a 2, 
a two cost unit that can grow really big, also a relic source in a deck that needs as many relics and as many different relics as possible. The relic you get is not even that bad, like crypt, cryptic etchings, uh, scouting. If you have spare power, is pretty nice. It makes it gives the deck a lot of card selection between uh, crypt ma cryptic master and other stuff. And yeah, the the card is basically a two drop that can easily outgrow any kind of unit, even like five and six drops in the game, which is uh, why it's so powerful among others. And a lot of the time in the deck, by the time you play it, it's like a three three, like you play a turn one red cage and then attack with a red, play crypt cryptic master or stuff like that. So by the time it attacks, it's usually like a 3-3 three, three or 4-4 four, four on turn 3. Then we have Teacher of Humility. It's not very hard to see why the card is good. The double time can be a bit tricky in a 25 power um, trifaction power base, but um, the deck basically has 20 out of 25 time sources and eight of the, uh, the 8 ready power sources are time, so you basically play like a depleted power s a time source on 1 and then a teacher on two a lot of the time and basically being a unit and a relic source and kind of disrupting your opponent giving you extra resources to work with triggering your red cage turning on your relic synergies for your other units is just so many things at once and being a two cost three three is also great so so many great things about this <laughs> um the other two drop that i have been running for the majority of the time that i'm currently trying not to run and that also, Moosh has been running in the Ranked Masters Challenge, is um, the Courier, uh, the Courtier, like the, let me show it to you guys real quick. Da -da -da. There we go. The Xenon 2 drop, the Elf, where is it? The Lethroy Courtier. Um, the card is very unaggressive, and but allows the deck to grind pretty well, get a lot of resources, turn on Obelisk, gives you um, power to ditch to Pitfall Trap, and also because it draws the top power of your deck, not just the random power from your deck, it makes it super unlikely to draw on power, because you're always drawing the power, so you only draw power in the rare cases where there's like, say, two power on top of your deck, otherwise the courtier will just uh, thin the power away from the top of the deck so you draw non-power cards which makes it even more powerful than it would already be but i wanted to try a bit more proactive and a bit more synergy a relic heavier approach so i'm currently trying let's try hideaways again as additional two drop because the deck sometimes uh, could have some consistency issues not find a relic early enough and then have these kind of a bit gimped units and hideaway is a great way to help with this it's also another diverse relic for stampede and stuff like that and Cryptic Master, and it's also a relic to easily sacrifice to a lesser lobotomy and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that's why I'm trying to change. But if you want to be on the safe side, just play for Lethroy Courtier over the hideaways, uh, as I have been in the doing in the past. It just adds a more staying power and grinding, grind potential to the deck, but makes it a little less consistent in getting the relic synergies uh, up and running early on. Then we have Great Value Smuggler. The nerf is fairly trivial to this deck. Sure, sometimes in the cases where your deck is not operating ideally and you don't have a relic, it would be much, much better if this would be a 3-3, but it doesn't really come up that often. And if you play it on turn 4 and don't have a relic, you can always just get like Infinite Hourglass from the market to turn on your relic synergies. That's part of why there is a cheap relic in the market, but I'll talk about the market uh, later. Uh, in more detail. Then we have Season Spelunker. This was a card that I tried, that I had in my early build, but temporarily moved out because the whole just playing like good stuff units didn't work as well. The deck was much more dependent on playing this kind of incremental advantage, grindy, go wide red cage game uh, until Cryptic Master came out because now it has the like unit density and consistency to go for more of this like um, over that it undercosted curve out plan that uh, the deck is going for now. It's also great, obviously, because the three cost five five is amazing, and then bringing a relic with you that also helps you turn on obelisk is great. So the card does a lot of nice things. And last but not least, for the units we have Severin, the Mad Mage. Um, this card is part of what 
made the deck a consideration and an option to begin with. Um, just being a four cost four five that has so many relic synergies by making your relics cheaper, making the activation of some of them cheaper, like using pitfall trap for zero is really really good. For example, using cryptic etchings for one is much much better. The rings, while on their own not that great, um, a lot of the rings are actually pretty nice in this deck, especially if the activation only costs two thanks to Severin. Like making a one one explorer for two is pretty solid, especially once you have don't have enough to do to use all your power anyway or like granite ring making uh giving you like a makeshift um sort of pump effect for your go whiteboard and even letting your bigger units just trample over trump blockers and stuff like that the weakest one is basically amethyst ring but there will still be games where you're stalled out and just make sure you don't get burned out and or allows you to kind of uh, burn out the opponent yourself if you can't get through um cobalt ring is just more pitfall traps basically an emerald ring is not great but can sometimes deal additional incremental damage build your board size or help you uh, solve sizing issues so they all do solid things the best two usually being amber ring or granite ring depending on what you have a need like if you have an obelisk you want amber ring if you have a red cage and like a bunch of units you rather want granite ring stuff like that and yeah the pledge is a nice addition that gives you up to like 12 turn one time sources for Prospector if you really need to. Um, it gives you a turn one sources for Red Cage if you really want to, like Red Cage into Master, for example. But all in all, I would avoid pledging this more often than not if you can afford to, because the card is pretty good and it's kind of a waste to pledge. It's more of something as a backup plan if you need to. Um, any other 4-5 body is also quite decent in the context of the deck. Now let's talk about the relics. We have the four pitfall traps. That's kind of like the snowball Yotun hurler of the deck, serving the same purpose, but it does a lot more because it has a relic for all the relic synergies. And it also, um, yeah. It also gives you card selection, card filtration, just getting rid of spare power or removal in matchups or situations where that's not good. So it just makes your deck a lot more consistent, gives you a quality advantage long term. Then obviously we have Red Cage, uh, kind of the best relic in the deck because it's basically a 1-1 one -one that brings a relic with it that has the potential to make more 1-1s. One so it's kind of like um, Renadin Drone type thing, except for the can't block. And um, yeah, kind of gives you this alternate plan of going wide with Obelisk and stuff when you're uh, one, two, three punch with your uh, curving out with big powerful units doesn't really work. And then you can just go wide, make a bunch of reds and uh, overwhelm the opponents. Particularly great against removal where obviously your individual units will just get picked off by removal, but dealing with red cage uh, swarms requires sweepers, so the opponent kind of needs spot removal and sweepers. And even if they have bows, they might still just kind of be ground out by red cages and obelisks and stuff in my experience. Then we have the Lesrai Hideaway that I mentioned, basically replacing Lesrai Cotier. Um, just another relic that isn't a great two drop, but it's a two drop. It can uh, get bigger if it's like the only thing left in a grindy game. Uh, by activating it, it's a relic for your relic synergies. It is a unit that can block unlike reds. So the card has been surprisingly uh, solid in my experience and the synergy with cards like Red Cage. Um, make it better than it uh, would normally be since obviously like a two cost two one even if you can like give it plus two attack permanently for three power would still be a pretty okay limited card at best but all the interlinking synergies in the deck make this uh, much better than the sum of its parts and then we have xenon obelisk basically the other like plan b because elves and rats aren't that great on their own, but Obelisk makes them matter a lot more. The other units in the deck don't need Obelisk that much, but they still appreciate it, so still has good synergy there. Um, and also gives you like more staying power, also against like other bigger units. Then we have the removal suit, two less right lobotomy, or equivocate for display. It's possible to go back to like three lobotomy, three equivocate, if you run the hideaways over the courtiers, 
but I have stuck to this for now, but I could totally see going back to 3.3. We went to like from 3.3 to like 2.4 because um, yeah, there was there were awkward situations where you had to like throw away good relics or had to th even throw away your only relic and stuff like that. That made the card, while very cheap and efficient, a bit um, yeah, situational and awkward. But yeah, it's obviously great. Like being able to kill anything for one power is great. So the card still uh, is pretty powerful. Equivocate is kind of the next best option because it's the deck is quite beat downy. So the tempo tempo in nature of Equivocate is pretty decent. We had permafrost initially, which is obviously much cheaper and more permanent in a way, in the sense that it doesn't it trades one for one virtually. Well, this doesn't. But um, since Boar is already a really strong card against you, uh, playing into that with Permafrost, them blowing up like some of their best units in the process and freeing them means you usually just lose. So we moved away from that and just have one Permafrost in the market because it's cheap and the best option for that, really. Um, so, yeah, basically, um, Equivocate just also has the upside that it's not completely blank against something like Huro Control because you can always just use it on your own units. When your opponent tries to kill them, you just return them and still have like either a card to mark it away, to Pitfall Trap away, or even a decent alternative body to redeploy again and trade Equivocate for their removal, using it as a bad removal counter, uh, which is also not irrelevant at all. Then we have Display of Knowledge. All three modes come up quite a lot. Um, actually, the removal mode kind of comes up the least, maybe, but still quite a lot, because you're often the attacker on the offense. You more often end up using it as a removal by using it as a combat trick. The great thing, though, is that the combat trick is permanent, so permanently giving plus two attack and quick draw to a unit, even something like a prospector is amazing. Then you suddenly have this 5-3 quick draw endurance, which is super annoying and super powerful. And yeah, you also can obviously draw relics. A lot of the time you will get Cage, sometimes you will get Pitfall Trap to kill something, or just an Obelisk to uh, power up your board. It's just a pretty versatile card. And obviously you still can use the removal to deal with like bigger flyers or Vara that is problematic and stuff like that. Um, but it's just really, really flexible. It can be a bit clunky, but it does a lot of things still. Um, during the tournament we had two Ember Waystone, two times Sigil, but I kind of moved to like three times sigil, one waystone since then, because even with two sigils, it came up too often that uh, we got like ice bolted and had already unfortunately drawn both sigils. It's kind of unlucky and not that likely, but the upside of waystone is so marginal that the downside of being ice bolted and not having a sigil to fetch is just more relevant in my opinion. So we went to like three one, uh, but we. I don't want to go to like 4-0 because gaining 2 health for free from your power base is still not nothing and at a certain point adding more sigils just doesn't really do a whole lot so adding more sigils kind of has diminishing returns on how much they do for your like ice bolt resiliency in a way and I decided that 3 is the maximum that I want and at least want that one Ember Waystone, especially against like more aggressive decks like Skycrack and stuff. Ember Waystone can make the difference between living and dying, so it's not like it does nothing, it just doesn't do that much that often. Um, yeah, and then we have 5 Crests, simply because Seeds don't work, insign Insignias don't work, and we already run the 12 banners that we can. Um, so we have the um, Crests accordingly and heavily leaning towards time crests, of course, because we have a turn 2 uh, double time play, so if you have to play turn 1 Crest of Cunning, we can't play T turn 2, which you want to avoid, but we needed another uh, Shadow Power Source, basically, uh, Shadow pr uh, Primal Power Source, basically, because we already have, and since we already have four Felm banners, Crest was the only option, and the only other way around this would have been to turn this into one of the two time crests, but then you would have to turn one of the sigils into a, um, like for example, having to turn this into a crest of wisdom and then turning one of these into a shadow sigil. But then you have the same issue that the shadow sigil makes it harder to cast teacher, even more so in a way than the crest of cunning because um, you need 
a ready turn two um, time source for teacher to work. So you want all your un uh, your undepleted power sources to be time, because otherwise you need a turn one prospector to play a turn two teacher um, by going like, and even then you need a ready time source because you play a turn one time and then a banner to play the teacher. So you don't really get around that because there's no line where you can go red cage into teacher, for example. So that's why this looks the way it does. And yeah, then we have obviously the four diplomatic seals, just like in Scream, they add a lot of flexibility and smoothness to the power base, allowing you to have um, more often than not a pretty normal sequencing and curving, uh, despite the um, heavy amount of depleted or situationally depleted power and high color requirements. And then a quick rundown of the market. Permafrost, you could argue this turning this into an ice bolt. It used to be equivocate before uh, we swapped them, but I still like permafrost better because um, the difference between four and five is pretty big. Being able to, like say, play a three drop and then as an alternate turn four drop instead of Severin or Obelisk, you just play Smuggler, get permafrost, lock down their, say, Champion of Chaos and attack is a pretty big deal. And with ice bolt, you delay this a whole turn more, especially now that there's no courtier anymore, uh, making the deck much uh, less likely to hit five reliably and also ice bolt has a reasonably high chance of helping your opponent and permafrost just does the job just fine more often than not so i'm pretty happy with permafrost but i could see trying ice bolt instead that's like the only two options you really have in the market here um, then we have the hourglass this used to be a sandstorm scarf but we just kind of felt it isn't really that needed because you know you're not really blocking even if you have a scarf both because your units are bigger so attacking is better than blocking because you're winning the race or your units can't block like the rats so um not much point in grounding the opponent's units if you just plan on racing anyway and you're good enough at racing that you usually don't get into a situation where you're losing the race and then would like to block or jump block to win the race um, that could come up, but I think it's not worth it having it. And I noticed that more often than not, I just got Scarf just to have a cheap relic to trigger multiple red cages, to turn on relic synergies that I didn't have yet and stuff like that. And Hourglass just adds a lot more incidental utility there, letting your, the only units in your deck that can block are your actual units because the reds can't. So if you attack with them, they can't block. So Hourglass lets you attack and block with them, which is pretty nice sometimes. Also, there is permafrost and other stunts from opponents where this can come in handy. And it's particularly good against something like Skycrack Ego. It's great against their permafrost. It's great at allowing you to cut their time short and pressure them while still uh, holding uh, holding them off on defense. And uh, yeah, this seems more threatening than, say, a slower Huru midrange deck flying over you, for example. Then we have Swift Refusal. This was a great addition to the deck. Um, yeah, just a one cost counter for Hailstorm, uh, Pristine Light, Harsh Rule, various spot removal and just big burn spells to burn you out is just amazing. Or even against Boar, this is a great answer against Boar. If you're up against like Stone Scar on the play, you just turn three or four, go smuggler for refusal especially if they set up their uh, merchant and then you just have refusal to not be burned out to not be blown out by spot removal and also not get like bored to death Boar is also much less of a problem for the deck than you would think it's pretty good against the deck but it's not like you automatically lose to it especially once we remove the power frosts so um, if you're up against say they have a merchant you can't prevent the boar next turn just make sure you keep you hold at least one relic back to reactivate your units because that's all the deck really needs to uh, execute its core functionality have this one relic to make all your units good it will your cryptic master obviously will suffer but everything else just works just fine and then you can just rebuild and refusal just completely blows that out of the water too and is a great first market thing to get against stone scum more often than not then we have Vault of the Praxis, that's like the go-to um, late game uh, grind engine, card is just bonkers with Red Cage, like you can go 
red cage into vault the same turn draw your first card basically and then from there just go nuts it's amazing like you have a red cage out you play a cryptic master you draw draw a card just by playing the cryptic master post combat and stuff like that or play a severin same thing play a less right hideaway with a red cage out another card it's just really runs away with the game and is why the deck just outgrinds and easily beats decks like Hero Control, which is insane. Um, so yeah, the card is very important. Um, and then last but not least, we have Bizarre Stampede. The card is really powerful when it's good. Um, it has less synergy with the deck than Obelisk, which is why Obelisk is in the main and Bizarre Stampede is in the market. I considered it the other way around. It just doesn't work that well. Um, when an Anthem effect is not good. Obelisk is still a relic that turns on your relic stuff and gives you reds, while Bizarre Stampede just does nothing. Um, but yeah, when it's good, it's great. It just makes your board massive and lets you just punch through everything. Like if you get in the stall, you eventually just get Stampede and win. It's just dumb. And there's also these like just one, two, three, four curve punches into Bizarre Stampede and your opponent's dead. Uh, really, really powerful card and a great tool to have access to. All right, this was a pretty long one again, but pretty in-depth. Hope you guys appreciate it. This is your full rundown of the Aurelian Relics deck, as I currently like it. Um, I think the deck is super powerful. It might very well be the best or one of the best decks right now. Uh, the deck, the main thing that kind of made some people on the team shy away from it is that the deck has its fair share of variants, and you kind of just like would scream aggro at its prime. Like it was the best deck, no doubt, but the deck still had a fair share of variants to it, and there could just be a streak of games where you just felt horrible and felt like you couldn't win, um, even though it was the best, most powerful deck. And I feel like this deck is in a very similar position. Um, if your deck is operating half decently, it's brutally powerful, but sometimes it just doesn't really operate and kind of get these weird mismatch draws, and you just kind of lose because of that. But it, the majority of the time, your deck just works well enough to win and I have been pretty impressed by the deck and that's part of why I added the hideaways over the courtiers to try and help to uh, alleviate some of these mismatch draw potentials where you have like units but no relics to turn them on and stuff like that and just make the deck a bit more coherent I just haven't tested it too much so I have to see if the courtiers end up harming the deck's uh, late game power or and or like power and yeah like sustainability uh, capabilities that it had and if that has negative effects on it because uh, on the surface level the straight swap seems like an like a fairly big upgrade in yeah making the deck a bit more consistent and coherent um so yeah i think the deck is really powerful moosh went i think like 10 and 2 with it uh, in the ranked masters challenge i played my games pretty rushed at the end was like 5 5 and then had no time to play the last two games and also because I didn't really take much time and played the game super fast to get all 12 in. I probably also didn't play all the games optimally, so could have potentially done better. And yeah, Moosh, I think, uh, lost a close uh, first match, one and two, uh, but made some mistakes in the third game. So um, yeah, even there it was a mix of like just things not going his way and making some mistakes. The deck has its a fair share of potential for mistakes and messing up stuff, so that happens to the best of us. Um, so yeah, give the deck a try, it's really powerful and it's definitely one of the potential tier 1 decks in my opinion that's kind of below the radar in a similar way as Scream was at the time when uh, GHP came up with the Scream aggro variant that was vastly different from the Scream deck that uh, I uh, created and uh, postulated at the time. Alright, as usual we're gonna hop into some games, show the deck in action, and show you how it does and how uh, to play it. So see you in a moment with the first game. Stay tuned.